therapy session. Our speaker is Professor Yue Rong. He will talk about uh, high-speed and water acoustic communications. Professor Yue Rong received a PhD in electrical engineering from Darmstadt University of Technology, Germany in 2005. Then he was a postdoc researcher at the University of California, Riverside, USA. Since December 2007, he has been with Curtin University, where he is currently a professor. He has co-authored more than 180 journal papers and conference papers in the area of signal processing communications, wireless communications, and the water acoustic communications, and the water optical wireless communications. He was the recipient of the Best Paper Award at the International Conference on Wireless Communications and the Signal Processing Best Paper Award at the Asia Pacific Conference on Communications and the Young Researcher of the Year Award of the Faculty of Science and Engineering at Curtin University. He is currently the Senior Area Editor of IEEE Transaction on Signal Processing. He was an Associate Editor for the IEEE Transaction on Signal Processing and Editor of the IEEE Wireless Communications Letters and the Guest Editor of the IEEE Journal on Selected Areas in Communications. So you, I pass the floor to you, and I'm looking forward to our talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Wang Chun, for your nice introduction. Um, today, as you can see, um, uh, I, ho I hope everyone can hear me clearly. So at least I think the, the channel between my mouse and my microphone is much more easy to handle than the underwater acoustic channel. All right, so uh, the topic, as you can see, is um, about high-speed underwater acoustic communications. So uh, compared with other topics like 5G and 6G uh, cellular communications, um, this topic is not as hot as those topics, but uh, I think it's a very interesting and challenging uh, communication channel for underwater uh, communications. And uh, we will show in this talk the challenges, and actually we also show the solutions we, which we attempted you know, um, there is no means we say that we solved all these challenges, just to, sh to share with you uh, how we try to uh, solve these challenges. So um, I hope this talk will inspire uh, many others to work in this uh, very interesting area. Okay, uh, the outline of this talk uh, was first start with the underwater wireless communications. So that includes um, not only the acoustic uh, communications, but also the other communication, uh, the other ways to, to send information through on the working a wireless way. And then uh, after that, we'll focus on the underwater acoustic channel. And the reason is that uh, we will see that the acoustic channel is the only way if we want to communicate over 100 meters on the water. So that's why that will be the focus of this talk today. Uh, of course, we will show the challenges in underwater acoustic communications. And then uh, we'll talk about two systems that we have developed over the years. One is a single carrier system. The other is uh, the multi-carrier OFDM system. And we will see uh, each system has its own challenges and how we attempted to solve these challenges. Um, then, um, so at last, um, we will show like two uh, recent works that which we attempted in this area, um, which we leveraged the uh, the power tool of neural network, just to help to um, understand how we can apply those uh, neural networks to uh, to make it to replace some of the functions in the conventional and water acoustic communication systems. And also we tried adaptive modulation. Um, so that's the ongoing work. But before I proceed further, I want to acknowledge my uh, collaborators, so Professor Sven Oldholm and uh, Dr. Alec Duncan at Curtin University. So they're my, they're my colleagues. Um, and also a college, uh, acknowledge the, my collaborator overseas. So they helped us a lot to just teach me a lot in. Uh, the other aspects of the underwater acoustic communications. And I also uh, uh, thank my research fellow and HDR students. So they actually implemented the uh, communication systems uh, for a real-time platform 
uh, which we have uh, developed recently. And I also want to thank the financial support from the ARC and from the DSC of the WA state government and also the, the DSTG group. All right, so this slide just uh, motivates us why we want to get rid of all the cables because uh, the, the cables, uh, they're quite expensive and especially for the underwater applications and they are more expensive than the normal cables. So anything on the putting on the water, so you basically add one zero to the cost. And another thing uh, which is very challenging for using cables on water is they have limited range. So uh, uh, that limits the motion of the, the transmitter and receiver as well. So particularly uh, thinking that if we want to uh, communicate on the water for two divers. Uh, so if you want to uh, get rid, if you want to communicate with the cable, so you know it's not quite convenient to, to swim around. So that's why we want to enjoy the, the wireless communication uh, on the water as well. Okay, so uh, th this slide shows that we have many potential applications for, for wireless uh, on the water communications. So we can have the motion monitoring um, in application, for example, when we can send pre-warning uh, if there is an earthquake, uh, which can potentially trigger a tsunami. So these signals, um, we can transmit through the underwater wireless channel to, uh, for example, a gateway in the on the surface, and then that gateway can further transmit signal to the to, to the base in the land, so that we can have we can win some time to do some tsunami warning. And then we can have the environment environmental uh, sensors, so which um, monitor, for example, the for the fisheries. Then people know when we uh, there is a school of fish coming, so that we can direct the the fishmen to to do the fishing over there. And also um, a big application for underwater communication is for the oil and gas industry, where they do the underwater uh, exploration and uh, lay their um, infrastructure underwater. And also they need to, to send uh, human beings and also remote operated vehicles to uh, maintain their pipelines uh, on the water, because in this case, it's a great advantage. So if they are ways, they can um, travel without a tether. So they can just travel along the pipeline and send uh, perhaps, uh, hopefully the, the real-time image and uh, real-time uh, sonar image to, to the base. And then we can see uh, what's going on, uh, whether we want to uh, replace some of the the pipelines. And also underwater com wireless communication can be used for the underwater rescue and, and survey. So we can use this one to first, um, before the oil and gas industry to lay their infrastructure, we can use the ROVs to, to take the, the images of the, the site which they want to build their infrastructure and the, that can be very useful if we, the images can be sent uh, through the wireless way. And also the underwater communications can be used between uh, divers. And of course, uh, it has many defense applications. So that's the, the traditional way uh, topic of the underwater wireless communication. Uh, this one shows here, I want to mention that uh, when we talk about underwater wireless communications, so um, we have possibly four ways to do to send informations to to modulate signal upon different uh, mediums. So you, you can see that we have the acoustics, and optical and ma magnet induction and radio. Um, by a first look at, of this table, so the first impression is uh, the data rate is much lower than we enjoy for cellular communication. So the highest speed we can achieve is maybe using the optical or, or radio uh, in the order of megabits per second. 
but for the for these two uh, approaches, we can only transmit within a hundred meters. So for the radio, uh, it, we can only transmit maybe within ten meters. That is because of the conductivity of seawater. So the radio wave is uh, greatly attenuated, so it wouldn't prop propagate over ten meters uh, for the for the data rate in, in the order of megabits per second. So if you want to transmit longer, so we can reduce the, the radio frequency, but again, uh, it's very hard to transmit over 100 meters with a reasonable size of the antenna on the water. So on the other hand, and the acoustic communication, so it has uh, even an, uh, a three order of a lower data rate compared with others. So typically we are expecting uh, kilobits per second for underwater acoustic communications. But the advantage of using acoustic is we have, we can reach a relatively longer range. So with uh, kilobits per second, uh, we can easily reach to the order of 10 kilometers for just a single hop. And if we are ready to reduce the data rate, for example, to 100 bits per second, and then we can even transmit over 100 kilometers. All right, so in general, the impression of, from this table is that we do have a range and rate trade-offs for different approaches. Um, a second point of each approach has its own challenges. So there is no, um, a golden rule of thumb or no uh, one shoes fit all approach to, to solve all the challenges. So that, that makes it in general the underwater wireless communication a very interesting area. Um, let's now focus on the acoustic communications. So because we said that the, this is the only way that if you want to achieve a distance of over 100 meters. Okay. Uh, for, for shorter range, we do have other applications as well. For example, if we want to do the, the data milling and uh, say the, the ROV is going to the, to the site and capture some image, and so it, it can save the image on its hard disk, and then when it returns to the, to the base, so it does not need to dock um, perfect into the base station in order to download the data. So in that case, if the ROV is within the range of uh, a couple of meters to the docking station, then in this case, the ROV can offload its data, for example, using the, the optical channel, which can support a data rate of megabits per second. So in this way, it shares the advantage of not no need for exact docking, and also it can uh, just offload as many data as possible. So that's the application for for short range uh, on the wireless communications. But here today, we um, mainly focus on the the medium and long range applications, which we are looking at the, the range over 100 meters. Right. Uh, the challenge in, in this area is particularly we we do have. Uh, very narrow bandwidth and also the harsh channel and lack of infrastructure. So the lack of infrastructure is a major problem for underworld communication because in the uh, terrestrial communications, we can build by stations um, you know, in 5G, so we can have a small uh, seals. In that way, we can uh, increase the data rate, but it's quite expensive as you can imagine to uh, maintain and establish uh, infrastructure for on the sea. Um, we can put some uh, floats there, uh, the boys there to as substation, uh, but we, can, we have to consider the weather conditions and whether the, the boys are there after a month or a year. So all this maintenance uh, makes the, the inf infrastructure very expensive for on the sea communications. Um, there is some brief history of the underwater acoustic communication. Basically, uh, that started basically in the Second World War because of the, uh, the submarine uh, communications. So at, at that time, so it's probably dominantly uh, used for the underwater telephony, on which people use the analog single side band, uh, using the bandwidth between 8 to 11 kilohertz. 
So that proved uh, working at that time. And in the 70s and 80s, um, there, were, there were further advances in, in this area. So we are, but still the, the technique was focused on no, non-coherent uh, techniques. Uh, because at that time, people believe it, it's very hard to achieve uh, coherent communications on water because of, of the, the harsh acoustic channel. And in the 90s, um, people realized uh, it's doable by uh, advanced advances in the signal processing and also the, the DSP chips. So we have more powerful hardware to do the real-time processing. So that led to the bandwidth efficient and coherent modulation and demodulation technology. So which uh, greatly increased the achievable data rate and also the range of the underwater communication. And when we, after we entered the, the new century, so uh, there have been more advanced signal processing technologies, for example, uh, the, the MIMO technology uh, and also the uh, multi-carrier OFDM uh, technology, so which have been uh, very useful in cellular communications. Um, people have uh, applied them to underwater communication as well. So uh, in that aspect, um, so any technology um, which we uh, used successfully in the terrestrial, terrestrial communication area, so we can try them uh, on the on what communication channel, but uh, just be careful. So um, not all technology is considering the, the particular challenges in the on water acoustic channel. All right, so um, before we talk about the, uh, the communication system design, so we have to understand the, the physics of the on water channel. Um, I will talk first about the the past loss of the acoustic channel. So you can see here this uh, capital A of LF. So that's the, the, the generally the, the past loss uh, between the transmitter and receiver. So it, it depends on uh, two factors. One is the range and the frequency. And um, it can be uh, written as two terms. The first one is LK, so which is uh, spreading loss. And that, that is because when we transmit uh, a signal, so then because of the, the wireless channel, so the signal got spread. And there are uh, two spreading models in the acoustic channel uh, with different K. When K is equal to one, so we consider it cylindrical spreading. So that happens normally in the uh, shallow water environment when the water depth is much, um, uh, smaller compared with the transmitter receiver distance. So basically we can see in this case, so because the acoustic wave uh, wouldn't propagate uh, above the sea surface and wouldn't uh, propagate further beneath the, the seabed. So in that way, the, the acoustic wave propagates following the, the cylindrical wave. So that's why we call this uh, cylindrical spreading. Um, when we transmit at a scenario where the, the water depth is comparable to the, the transmitter receiver distance, so we're talking about medium to uh, a deep sea communications. So in that way, you can see the, the medium between the transmitter and receiver is, is like sphere. So when we transmit signal, so the signal spreads both in, in all directions in like sphere. So this we call the spherical spreading. So for spherical spreading, the, the loss is, uh, is bigger than the cylindrical spreading. Uh, so in practice, um, as a rule of thumb, we usually choose k equal to one and a half. So at least uh, we can use that to plan the, the link budget when we decide so how much power we need uh, to reach the receiver. So in that case, as uh, as a rule of thumb, which was k equal to 1.5. Okay, so this is about the spreading loss. Uh, another one is the, the abs absorption loss, which actually uh, is uh, much bigger than the spreading loss. That is because the, the conductivity of the, um, 
the ocean water. So also that absorption loss is strongly uh, frequency dependent. As we can see from this figure here, uh, what we see is the absorption coefficient, which is a small a we see in the previous slide. So it has a unit of dB per kilometer. As we can see, um, the horizontal axis is the, the kilohertz in terms of the, the carry frequency of acoustic wave. So we can see um, there is huge difference if we increase the, the carrier frequency. Let's say um, if we're looking at the uh, 200 kilohertz of uh, carrier frequency, so we expect that the um, signal will, will be uh, attenuated by 50 dB after one kilometer. So 50 dB means uh, uh, 10 to the power of five. So we are losing, um, hundred thousand times uh, after the signal is transmitted uh, after one kilometer. So just if you think of that, so it's a significant loss compared with uh, the land-based communication system. Right, so if you want to uh, further increase the carrier frequency, for example, uh, to uh, 500 kilohertz, right? So in that case, so we're expecting uh, absorption loss over 100 dB after a kilometer. So this is uh, quite huge, uh, quite challenging uh, for any communication system. The next slide is the, the ambient noise uh, in our water. So it's quite interesting that uh, we have all sorts of uh, noise uh, sources from the underwater environment. So we can have the, the shipping noise and uh, the surface noise and the biological noise and other noise. So this, the, this figure here is, uh, I think it's a measurement from the uh, Australian water. So we can see here, the Tasman Sea has more uh, traffic than the other parts of the Australian water. So the, the, the traffic noise is presented by the, the dashed curve. So it, it's mainly a low frequency noise uh, around uh, 100 hertz. And the, the solid lines means the underwater noise increases with uh, the, uh, the speed of the wind. Okay, so that is reasonable because when the wind speed increases, so we have uh, more breaking waves and also uh, that increases the noise level. Another interesting thing is the, uh, the noise introduced by the, the underwater uh, mammals and fish and also shrimp. So you can see that uh, they can make uh, a huge contribution to the noise, uh, no matter at daytime or at evening. So there is also something very noisy. Okay, um, the general, um, the idea for the underwater ambient noise is uh, strongly site dependent, uh, depends on the time and the weather conditions. So that makes uh, it even headache for us to design communication system. That means uh, if we want to make the, the communication system working, so ideally we should try uh, to test the system at different sites, uh, at different time, and different weather conditions. So that costs money to, to, to have all these tests done. Uh, interestingly, the underwater, uh, the noise is definitely non-Gaussian. Okay, so if we, uh, design the transceiver based on the Gaussian um, uh, assumption. So that can be quite misleading. So that's another lesson we learned uh, when we do, do the transceiver design. So the, the underwater noise can be quite impulsive. And uh, in this slide, a couple of slides later, I will show some video uh, audio clip. So which you can see that the, the clip, which we call the, uh, the clapping shrimp noise. So which is quite uh, impulsive. Uh, this slide shows that the, the bandwidth which we can use to uh, send signals through the acoustic channel. Um, so this is shown, basically you can view this as the, the signal to noise ratio, which is one over the, the IN. So IN is the multiplication of the pass loss and also the noise. So that one in the 
in the numerator, you can view it as the normalized signal level. So here, the, there was a couple of uh, key informations which we can uh, absorb here. First, the, the bandwidth is quite narrow. So we are talking about kilohertz, uh, where, while in the 5G, so we're talking about uh, gigahertz bandwidth. So that's uh, six orders of a smaller compared with the, the 5G communication. And also the second uh, message which is delivered in this figure is the, the bandwidth reduces uh, significantly when we want to reach uh, further uh, communication range. So if we can see that around 10 kilometers, so the bandwidth available is around eight kilohertz. Okay, so if you want to reach uh, 10 times of the, the range to achieve uh, communication for 100 kilometers, so then the bandwidth available is mainly um, less than uh, two kilohertz. Okay, so that brings the fundamental trade-off between the rate and uh, the range. I mean, that, that trade-off is also available for cellular communications. Um, the trade-off is, uh, is generally true for all wireless communications, but the point is for underwater, so this uh, trade-off is more sharp, it's more obvious uh, than any other communication systems. All right, so um, the achievable, achievable range rate product for underwater, wire, uh, opt, sorry, underwater acoustic communication um, at the year of 2000, so there has been some uh, survey paper showing that the achievable range rate product is around 40 kilometers, uh, kilobits per second. All right, so that means um, we can send um, 10 kilobits per second over four kilometers, or if we want to reach 100 kilometers, so we can only uh, transmit uh, a quarter of the uh, a quarter kilobits per second. And then after around 10 years time, um, because of due to the efforts of all these researchers and the uh, industry practitioners, so the, we managed to uh, push the, the achievable range rate product to a hundred kilobit uh, multiplied with uh, kilobits per second. So you can see it took researchers 15 years to double the, the range and rate product. So if we compare with the, the famous Moore's law in this microelectronics, which says the number of uh, uh, electronic components will double uh, every year, every 12 months time. So it, it took 15 years to double in the, the underwater communication area. So that, that's, that makes it interesting and, and challenging for researchers. And the next slide uh, shows the uh, multipulse propagation. So, in addition to the uh, the long pass, uh, the large pass loss. So, the another challenging aspect is we do have uh, the multipass propagation. So that is partly because of the the speed which um, you know we, we modulate the the acoustic waves. So the the sound speed on water is not constant. Is the figure on the left shows that it depends on the depth of the water. So uh, in the surface, in the top 50, 100 meters, so where the, the water is well mixed up because of the movement of the waves and the, the, the sunshine can reach around 50 meters. And so in this case, the uh, temperature is approximately constant in this range. And when we go further, down to a deep ocean. So the first thing we will ex experience is the, the sound speed drops because the, the, the water gets colder, right? Um, but after it reaches some certain range because of the, the pressure of the water, so the, the sound speed increases again. So this decrease and increase uh, creates some effect. It's like the it's like a ducting effect for the underwater acoustic wave. So where um, you can see on the figure on the right, so which we call um, the sofa channel, which is short for the uh, sonar fixing and range channel. So that is approximately in the range between uh, 600 meters and one kilometer, depends on different locations of the earth. Um, that channel 
we can relatively uh, transmit signals with, with relatively small loss. So if, if we want, we can actually transmit uh, signals from the, the North Pole to the South Pole um, with sufficient power and sufficient low data rate. So there has been some experiment uh, which um, people were sent um, signals from the Hertz Island, uh, which is a small island in the south of Ind Indian Ocean. It's an uh, Australian territory as well. So that signal can be received uh, up to the uh, Bermuda uh, in the US. So yeah, that, that, that part in the use is uh, the SOFA acoustic channel. All right. Um, also, if we are considering the uh, the shallow water communications, so the, the challenging scenario is the the multi-pass reflections, which uh, in addition to the the direct pass from the transmitter and receiver, so we have the the pass from reflected by the the surface and reflected by the seabed as well. And sometimes in that we have multiple reflections uh, between the transmitter and receiver. So that creates a multi-pass channel with a very long uh, delay spread. So for the shallow water channel, for example, when we talk about shallow water, is any water which the, the depth of the communication is much smaller compared with the, the, the range of the communication. So in that case, oftentimes we have several tens of uh, milliseconds delay. Right. So if we're talking about medium length communication, which we uh, communicate over a couple of uh, hundred meters, so that um, delay spread can be over a hundred milliseconds. Right. If we attempt long distance communications over a hundred kilometers, uh, the, the delay spread can be over a second. So that means if we, if you shout to your, your partner, so that issue uh, can, can still be heard after one second. So considering the uh, the underwater channel, so this long delay spread is quite significant compared with the the, the land uh, communication channel. And uh, also the it's not only spreading in the frequency, and also it's spreading the time as well. So that is because of the, the Doppler spread. Um, the Doppler spread and Doppler shift is more significant uh, considering that the sound speed is only one and a half kilometer per second compared with uh, 33 three times 10 to the power of 8 meter per, um, per second um, of the electronic magnetic wave. So that is uh, five orders lower and then the speed of the EM wave. So basically you can think any motion, uh, reasonable motion on water uh, will create the equivalent effect of a high speed bullet trend in the, in the radio communication. Okay, so if you swim um, towards your, your receiver, so that swimmer, if you compare with the, the cellular communication, uh, he's, he's traveling at the speed of the the bullet trend at 500 kilometer per second. So that's why this underwater communication channel is uh, both uh, spreading in the time domain and in the frequency domain. So this double spreading, so it's a killing factor if you want to uh, make the any improvement in the underwater acoustic communication. All right. Um, yeah, this slide shows uh, interestingly this uh, underwater communication channel, although it's very narrow band, but it is a kind of broadband system. So that's what we call it broadband system with narrow bandwidth. This is because the, the bandwidth of the underwater acoustic system is comparable to its carrier. So the one common system which uh, people use is around 12 kilohertz carrier frequency because at this range, so the, uh, the acoustic wave can uh, propagate um, up to 10 kilometers without any problem. So that's why it's, uh, it's uh, a popular frequency range uh, for underwater communication. But for that 12 kilohertz range, so because in order to improve the the data rate, so we often use um, four kilohertz or even eight kilohertz uh, bandwidth. 
So in that aspect, the, the bandwidth and carrier ratio is only one to three, while for an LT system, we consider 50 megahertz bandwidth at two gigahertz carrier. So although that 50 megahertz bandwidth is much broader than the four kilohertz bandwidth, but compared with the two gigahertz carrier, so it's still we can treat the LTE system uh, more or less as a, a narrow band system, but definitely uh, that narrow band assumption uh, is not uh, applicable to the underwater acoustic system. Right, so that means when we uh, design, for example, the equalization design, so we have to consider that's a broadband system. So that, that makes the, the Doppler effect estimation and compensation extremely hard because we, we can't just treat the, the, the Doppler effect as a carrier frequency offset as what we normally do in cellular communications. So we have to do uh, other op operations to compensate this broadband Doppler. Uh, make, to make things worse, the, the Doppler effect of each part can be quite different. That is especially true when we consider uh, the uh, short range uh, at deep water communication. So when the, the, the water depths um, is comparable to the communication range. So in this case, um, any movement between the transmitter and receiver um, can be quite different for different paths. Okay, so for the direct path, there is uh, one Doppler frequency and for the path reflected from the, the ocean surface, it can be another a different Doppler effect. So um, that means if we try to uh, correct the Doppler effect just based on the Doppler uh, frequency of one pass, so that is not sufficient. So we have to consider the, that each pass may have a different uh, Doppler effect. All right, so that's, those are about the, the software challenges. The hardware challenges is, um, is also there. So that means when we design the, the transceiver um, electronics, uh, we have to consider the, the broadband uh, impedance matching. Uh, because it's a broadband system, so the impedance depends on the frequency range. So we have to uh, do the broadband uh, impedance matching. And also different transducers can have different uh, impedance. So uh, theoretically, or at least in theory, so we have to design the impedance matching network for each individual uh, uh, transceivers. All right, and the other fact is uh, the, the power amplifier design. So um, in, the, in this range of uh, over 100 kilohertz, um, that is uh, quite um, uh, frequency band, which is above the audio frequency band, but it's uh, far lower than the IF band. So in that range, so not many options are available uh, for the power amplifiers. So oftentimes uh, we have to end up with uh, design our own amplifiers. Well, I think uh, I, I try to click this uh, sound here to give us an idea. So what is the, the transmitted signal and how it is distorted and how it sounds like a receiver. So this sound is uh, recorded during our, one of our uh, experiments. So it uh, has a four kilohertz bandwidth and 12 kilohertz carrier. I hope uh, you can hear it. All right, so that's, uh, I'll play it again if you. Okay, so this, this is like um, uh, a communication signal. So, but this one here, if you play this one, so I hope you can hear it clearly. Um, it has like this uh, frying, uh, frying egg noise. It's quite um, impulsive noise there. So, Yeah, I hope you get the idea. All right, uh, I think I spent too much time about this with this introduction. So now I, we will discuss some of our um, work, which we attempted to to solve these problems uh, by just increasing the range and the rate of uh, underwater communications. So we have developed two systems. One is a single carrier system, and the, the other is OFDM system. So for the single carrier system, 
uh, which we focus on the challenge of the, the time wiring channel. So the system uh, which we developed is used to uh, receive the signals which we uh, transmit as far as uh, 10 kilometers. So here you can see the uh, close to the red uh, circle here, these are the locations of the, the receiver. And this yellow one here is the location of, of the, uh, sorry, the, the, the red one is actually the location of the transmitter and the, the yellow one is the location of the receiver, okay. And you can see here, that's the, the arrangement of the experiment to the right-hand side, where you can see that we, the, the, the receiver here is floating um, as well, and the transmitter is, strip, is, uh, is drifting with the boat. So we, based on the, the GPS data, so we can calculate the average drifting speed is uh, 1.7 meters per second. And that is the channel profile, which we can see from the from the left hand side. So you can clearly get an idea that um, just in the short time of the four, um, four simple blocks, all right, uh, so the, the channel can be quite different between the first block and the fourth block. So that is a uh, challenge of the, the time wiring channel. And to, to cope with this problem, so we, we applied the technology of the, uh, the forward backwards channel tracking. So we use the training sequence first to get some initial estimation of the channel uh, from both the, the training sequence in front of the data and, and the back of the data frame. So then we use the tracking uh, technique to just uh, to, to get a, a better, a pre, a more precise estimation of the channel for the second data block and the third data block. And the figure on the right shows the, the performance of the bit rate versus the, the distance you can see by using this uh, backward and forward tr tracking, so we can uh, improve the, the bit rate performance. And then the, uh, the, the Doppler effect, which, uh, which uh, leads to the, the carrier frequency offset, uh, which we have also developed some uh, technique, which we call the, the, the two-step uh, carrier frequency offset estimation and compensation. So we'll first do some coarse uh, estimation here. And after that, we do some fine estimation and also we do the, um, the linear interpolation for the carrier frequency offset within uh, a simple block. So we see that technique, the system can tolerate uh, faster and uh, randomly varying uh, Doppler effect. So this is uh, the result which we obtained. Uh, you can see that the Doppler uh, shift it can be up to uh, four or five hertz, so which is quite uh, significant. And after this core um, fine is Doppler estimation, so we can see that the, the bit rate is greatly reduced. And if we can um, further include the, the interpolation uh, between the, the Doppler of two um, symbols, so we can further reduce the the bit rate of the, the signal. And that is the, the receiver's uh, equalization structure, which we used for the, uh, the, the single carrier system, but we do it uh, in the frequency domain. So we, we applied the iterative frequency domain equalization. So we can see that after the four iterations, so relatively we can see clearly the, the scatter plot of the four uh, QPS sky signal. Still, you can see that this is uh, the, for the uncoded system, uh, we still have a relatively higher uh, raw bit rate. So it's still 3%. So that means uh, you know, um, channel coding is definitely needed in the underwater approach communications. The second system we developed is uh, the multi carrier system. Uh, this time we learned the lesson from the, the previous time. So the previous time we we let the, the receiver to drip with the, the current. So that cost us uh, quite significant effort to, uh, to be able to decode the signal which we receive. Now we said, oh, we learned the lesson. So now we, this time we can see the figure on the right. So we, we fix the position of the receiver by just fixing it on a, on a steel frame. So we drop the frame into the river. So because the, the, the current movement in the river is much uh, less than the ocean. So this time we hope we have uh, a channel which is less time varying. 
So that proved working. So we are able to get a more stable channel, which you can see on the right hand side. So the, the channel between two blocks uh, doesn't change as much as the first time. Okay. But now we have another headache here is because of the the trans, trans, uh, the receiver is located close to a JT. So uh, we measured this, that trial was uh, done in early uh, summer in December. So there was quite a uh, significant activity of the, the clapping shrimps. So all this impulsive signal here is caused by the shrimp when they're snapping their, uh, their claws. So this we call the snapping shrimp noise. So this impulsive noise, if it's not mitigated, so uh, that will uh, reduce the performance of the receiver. So conventional way of uh, handling the impulsive noise is we do the clapping. But uh, if we do the clapping here, or do the blanking still, after we're blanking the, the, the big impulsive signal, so still there are a couple of other impulsive, still there's remaining a impulsive noise. So that means uh, you know it's hard to come up with uh, a proper threshold for this blanking. So this is uh, another challenge in, uh, in on word communications. So to deal with that, we have tried the way to consider that although it is quite impulsive, um, but we do have the uh, the sparsity in that uh, clapping shrink noise. So that sparsity, uh, together with the sparsity of the underwater channel. Uh, which uh, inspired us to use the compressive sensing based channel estimation. So here, what we have here, if you look at the last line of the equation, so this alpha p here is the unknown variable which we want to estimate. It contains both the multipass channel and impulsive noise. Uh, so after this technology, we can see that um, there are many uh, information to here. I just want to mention the first one first line, a second line, and to the last line. So the first line, so we use uh, the classical least square um, um, estimation, channel estimation, without any blanking. So the, the bit error rate is uh, over 13%. Uh, if we do blanking, so that helps a lot to, it helps uh, not a lot by dropping maybe 2% of the uh, draw bit error rate. But if we can use the, the our, our approach using the, uh, the, the joint channel and the interference uh, impulsive noise estimation, so we can reduce, we can half that of uh, the raw bit rate. And also if we uh, compare the, the frame error rate, which is the last column, so without any blanking operation, so we have the 71% of the frame error rate but after the uh, using our approach, we, we managed to bring that number to zero. Um, we have further approaches, uh, which we consider both the, the challenging of the underwater channel, which is in time varying and also impulsive noise. Okay, so we try to attack those two challenges at the same time. So which we, uh, which we developed is some uh, spatial bias in learning based approach. And then that is followed by the, a forward backward common filtering. So by using that way, so we can uh, further reduce the, uh, the frame rate and bit error rate. I think I maybe have five minutes more, so I have to, uh, to speed up. And the third topic which we have developed is to do this uh, actually real time uh, prototyping. So um, unlike the previous, uh, slides I've shown of which we process the recorded data. So in this slide, we actually show a real-time prototype, so which means the, the signal processing is uh, started uh, after the signal is received, and we are able to process the signal uh, within uh, the frame time of the transmitted signal. So that is actually a real-time system in the loop. Uh, we, this system here is our first system which uh, we still, uh, which we worked in the, the range of the uh, carrier frequency of 12 kilohertz. So the, the bandwidth is four uh, kilohertz. Where we use this, um, the National Instrument um, Data Acquisition Device, which is called CDAC. 
So the, the figure in the middle is a CTAC device. And uh, so that CTAC device transmits signal to the uh, first is amplified by the amplifier, which is the, the yellow box, which you can see on the right hand side. And after the power amplification, the signal is passed through uh, the matching network. So that's a small box uh, on the left hand side of the same figure. After the, the match network, the signal is uh, sent through the, the transducer, which is the, the black uh, cylinder you can see on the, the lower right hand side of this figure. And that signal uh, is transmitted to the hydrophone to the left hand side. And the, the signal receives through the hydrophone, then it's uh, preamplified and then it's, uh, it's received by this uh, dark device. And this dark device is uh, connected to the, the host PC through the USB. So this is site which we um, tested the, the transducers, uh, the, the prototype, so it's in the Canning River. So each time I went, we went there, uh, we, we got uh, quite of uh, curious questions uh, from, uh, from children. So each time I, I managed, oh, I'm not sure whether I managed it enough. So I said, if you want to understand this, you can study electrical engineering at Curtin University. So this is the, the interface, which uh, the software interface, you can see that the, we can monitor the, the real time uh, spectrum of the transmit signal and we can monitor the, the transmitting waveform. And this is uh, the receiver uh, interface. So we can see uh, on the right left hand side, we have uh, four QPSK uh, modulation scheme. So we can uh, view this one uh, real time uh, when the system is running. And the right hand side is the, the 16 qua modulation. And you can also see that the pass band waveform and the, the, the baseband waveform. All right, so this is the, the real time uh, decoding result uh, using the 16 qua uh, modulation uh, constellation. And where we can see the, the horizontal axis is alpha. It's, we didn't show it in the convention SNR because the, the SNR is quite hard to de determine uh, for the underwater environment because the, the reason we mentioned before, because uh, the, there is a lot of impulsive noise. So it, it's hard to measure the, the power of impulsive noise uh, because you don't know whether, uh, which one you, you should treat as noise and which one you should treat as signal. So to avoid that problem, we show the performance versus the alpha. So the idea is increasing the alpha is kind of uh, increases the signal to noise ratio. Uh, so for the alpha equal to um, the first alpha here is uh, similar to the ambient noise level. So for the third alpha here, uh, you can see that the signal component is standing out of the background noise. And we have also extended the system to a two by two MIMO system uh, two years ago. So we have a two by two system where we have two transmitters and everything uh, is two matching networks and two power amplifiers and the two hydrophones at the receiver. And uh, also the lesson we learned that we have to um, do the carry offset estimation each individually because even though the two receivers they are located the, only 50 centimeters apart, but because they still can have quite uh, different behavior for the carrier offset. So that has to be done individually. So this slide shows the, the bit rate performance. Okay, so that one you can see here, the channel one and the channel two. Okay, so even though they are located quite uh, close to each other, they, they do have different uh, performance because of the, the reason we said they have different noise flow and they have different uh, carrier frequency offset. Okay. But definitely by compare, combining these two streams, so we can like, achieve a better uh, bit rate performance. Okay, um, the last two topics I want to mention is the, um, our recent work, which we want to apply the, uh, or uh, try to apply the neural network to the, uh, the receiver of underwater acoustic communication. Uh, we just um, did some simple uh, method, which we, we didn't use any advanced neural um, network uh, techniques. 
uh, like CNN or DNN. So here we, we just use the, uh, the fully connected neural network, which we call the MLP, a multi-layer perceptron. So here we only replace the, the work which is done by conventional demodulator. So the channel estimator and the channel equalizer, we still use the, the conventional approach. So we will just replace that um, demodulator. It's because uh, uh, we hope uh, that is the, the, the simplest way to, to try um, whether it's feasible to apply the, the neural network at all. So uh, the initial result is, is somehow encouraging if you can see that they compare with the solid uh, lines, which um, are the approach, which is the approach where we use the, the conventional demodulator. The dashed lines here is we replace that conventional demodulator by this uh, neural network based symbol detector. So for some SNRs, it, it does reduce the, the symbol array of the system, but for some other SNRs, so it doesn't. Okay. I guess it all depends on uh, the, how fast the, the time varying channel it is. And uh, it, that mainly leads to the mismatch between the training, um, the, the training data and the received data. So you could train your neural network based on training data, but then actually when you receive the data, so the channel environment has already changed. So that is a significant challenge when one wants to apply the, the neural network to to uh, the underwater communication. It's time varying of the channel. I recently, uh, one of our HDR students, uh, she had tried to uh, use the adaptive modulation for underwater acoustic communications. So what we know is that because of the, the underwater communication, is time is, uh, has uh, reached multi-pass uh, environments. So that means the, in the frequency domain, so there are lots of uh, deep fights for the channel. So what we want to use is to try to discard those data subcarriers which are in deep fight. And for the remaining subcarriers, we also ad adaptively allocate modulation schemes based on the, the SNR received at, at a particular cluster of subcarriers. Okay, so this is a system which we uh, we tested uh, initially in the tank. So we will go to the river to test uh, in the near future. So this is system here, which is a, a two-way communication system. So the uh, signal received at the receiver, we just calculate the SNR and and feedback of which constellation should be used uh, for the next frame. So this is the figure here. All right, so which we can show is the, the amplitude of the, uh, this is the, the amplitude of the channel versus the subcarrier. So we can see that indeed we have lots of deep fights. Okay, so the figure on the left hand side, the lower figure, so that's the, the loaded bits. So you can see the concept of the adaptive modulation. So that when the channel is in deep fight, so we, we, we just um, discard those subcarriers at all. So if it's not in deep fight, we, we allocate lower modulation schemes, for example, two bits per second, uh, two bits, uh, that means QPSK. So if the channel has very good uh, frequency response, so we allocate this 16 quam uh, as modulation. All right, so the two figures on the right, you can see that if we increase the, the signal to noise ratio, so the, the Landed loaded bits, so it increases first from the BPSK, then to uh, QPSK, then finally to 16 quam. And the figure on the right, the lower figure, so you can see the average, uh, when the average received SNR increases, for, for example, from 15 uh, dB to, uh, let's say, say uh, 30 dB. So the data rate can increase from uh, 2,000 bits per second up to 7,000 uh, per second. So that makes, um, it, it, it is uh, feasible to consider the adaptive modulation scheme um, in, on the water. But uh, the, the, the thing which we are investigating now is to how to reliably feed back the, uh, how to make the reliable uh, feedback channel because the anything, um, messed up in the feedback channel will just increase the, dramatically the, the bit rate. 
I think a bit out of time, and thanks for your attention. So I'm ready to keep uh, take any questions you, you have.